this lecture is going to be the first that sets off a few um, other lectures. So our title, I'm telling you this because there's a backstory, um, our title is how to use it safely and effectively. Um, but what you're going to see is the vast majority of the data for today is on the safe use. So focused a little bit more on the adverse effect tolerability and monitoring profile. The reason for that is in a couple weeks, we're going to look at comparison efficacy data of antipsychotics, anticonvulsants in lithium. And then a couple weeks after that, looking at lithium's um, neuroprotective neurotoxic effects. Um, so recognizing we're going to kind of focus on the efficacy a little bit later, this one is a little bit more focused on the adverse effect profile. So we're going to look at indications first. So if we're going to use it, where should it be used? just briefly, um, and then looking at short and long-term adverse effects, a little bit of meta-analytical data, um, comparing lithium to placebo for some of the um, more concerning adverse effects, and then refreshing everyone on some monitoring parameters so we could safely use lithium. So to get started with, um, Lithium is formally approved for the treatment of manic episodes um, and as a maintenance treatment for bipolar one disorder. In general, it's used for um, mania and depressive episodes as well as maintenance in bipolar disorder. It's used in other mood episodes. It's used for depression um, and for suicidal ideation with mood disorder. Interestingly, this is a product that's been, as Dr. Messamore had mentioned, it's been around for a really long time. So from a utilization, uh, from a marketing perspective, the utilization isn't really being driven as much by marketing as some of the other competing medications may be. Um, so for example, a lot of the second generation antipsychotic medications, there was a budget there um, for promoting the indications in the use of those products for bipolar disorder, um, which may have made lithium fall a little bit farther down the wayside in the way that it was portrayed which is why I put my little um, man walking up the stairs there. Lithium is not one of the agents where you have to wait to fail other agents first. Um, it, it tends to be um, still one of the gold standards that we see for bipolar disorder. Um, it is tricky to use, but it doesn't mean it can't be used. Um, so this shouldn't be one of the agents that we really put on the back burner. It still should be in the discussion for a number of these disorders. But the reason that it's not, is due to the hesitations of use. So a lot of individuals are um, hesitant to either take it or have one of their family members take it, and there may be some reluctance um, to prescribing lithium because of some of the risk of toxicity. So the narrow therapeutic index, um, recognizing that um, we have to be tracking serum concentrations, uh, renal function, thyroid function, as well as other um, adverse effects that can occur with this. So we're going to look specifically at the tolerability um, with, with lithium. So this is by no means an all-inclusive list, um, just some of the adverse effects of lithium. So on the left-hand side, um, starting with alopecia, are a number of adverse effects that have relatively commonly been reported with the use of lithium products. Um, this medication has been around long enough um, that if you look in tertiary resources, things like Lexicom, things like Micromedics, um, there isn't the clear delineation of incidents. So which one is the most frequent, um, which may be less frequently reported and least likely to be reported. They tend to all be piled together. Um, but these tend to be the adverse effects that are seen relatively frequently. Um, so alopecia, gastrointestinal disturbances, um, patients can have drowsiness, taste changes, um, increased thirst, and then weight. And it's been reported in both directions, although we're going to be a little more focused on weight gain today. Other a uh, little bit more serious adverse effects um, that may not develop um, a tolerance, not that patients will become tolerant to the alopecia, but um, that we need to be mindful of in a different way. Hypothyroidism tends to be one of the most common, and we're going to look at that specifically. With higher concentrations um, and serum levels, cardiac arrhythmias could be problematic, but we can see other changes as well, including 
um, hyperglycemia, hypercalcemia associated with hyperparathyroidism. We can see kidney changes in a number of different ways. We're also going to look at that. And then as we've mentioned a little bit in the past, we can also see some leukocytosis. So recognizing that there's quite a few adverse effects, I wanted to break it down into short term and then a little bit longer term. So in the short term, when patients are started on lithium, um, the prescribing information does recommend anywhere from 300 to 900 milligrams daily, um, and that that's in divided doses, depending on a patient's renal function, depending on other comorbid conditions that they may have. Um, it is recommended that the patients take this with food to try to assist with some of those gastrointestinal issues. Um, so the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea that may occur. Um, if they're increasing the dose, increasing that bedtime dose or the one that happens later in the day to try to assist them um, so that they can sleep through that adverse effect. Um, but for a lot of these side effects, the patient will become tolerant to it as they, um, as they get used to and have had the medication on board for a longer period of time. One of the considerations that's reported with the use of lithium um, that isn't necessarily one of the side effects, but tends to be one of the um, desired effects is the improvement in manic symptoms. For some patients, if they've had a euphoric mania, they may feel that lithium doesn't make them feel quite as well. Um, maybe they don't feel that um, that they don't feel quite as energetic or creative or um, really have that euphoric on top of the world type feeling. And that may result in a really negative connotation with the use of lithium. Um, so not necessarily a side effect, but that is something to keep in mind. That may be something that also sticks with the patient. I felt great and now you gave me something where it makes me not feel so great and I don't have those other effects that I did like where I had tons of energy. As patients may be on lithium long term, there are some adverse effects that are problematic. I selected these two specifically. Um, I had a patient um, at a community mental health clinic in downtown Akron who, um, she, she was wonderful. She was in her mid 70s. She was a widow. She lived independently on a farm that she ran by herself. She had done so since her husband had passed away. Um, about 10 or 15 years prior, she was relatively independent. Um, she had developed an infection and ended up on an antibiotic um, and then became lithium toxic. So she had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder when she was in her early 20s. She had been stable on lithium since that time. And because she had become lithium toxic um, and she was older, they discontinued the lithium and ended up putting her on. Um, at the time I had, I saw her. Um, she had been on four other medications and she was currently on a combination with Divalproex and Quetiapine and she hated it and it was not controlling her, her mania. Um, because she had developed hypothyroidism, they were really concerned about her renal function because she was older. There was significant reluctance to go back on lithium. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget, she was a, a spunky little lady. She was wonderful. Um, I could totally see her running the farm. She wanted to talk about the risks and then wanted to come up with a plan to talk to her psychiatrist who was new. Um, she'd been managed by her um, family doc until she got toxic and they wanted her to see a psychiatrist um, to lobby to be put back on lithium. She, she brought in a whole stack um, she wasn't sleeping very much, so she brought me in a whole stack of literature that talked about the renal function issues. So the renal function piece, there's a whole bunch of different conditions that can happen. Um, and recognizing that as patients get older, that is going to be something we need to keep in mind, but we can dose adjust. Lithium is... Um, it's pretty linear in its pharmacokinetics. We can estimate how much we may need to change that. So these long-term effects, I'm not saying they're not serious, um, but it is something that we need to keep in mind and make sure that we're discussing with the patient. Um, how common are they for the hypothyroidism? Um, there was a, a meta-analysis that was done that looked at over 385 trials, um, and they pulled apart the ones that looked specifically at different adverse effects. 
So in this one, there were eight randomized controlled trials that compared lithium to patients that were not on lithium. And they found that um, patients on lithium um, had an odds ratio of six to develop hypothyroidism. So we recognize what that mechanism is. It's relatively well known. Um, it looks like at least 18 months is needed of therapy. So that may be something that would be an important counseling point to know, um, but in many patients, it can be controlled with um, thyroid supplementation. So yes, something we need to keep in mind, but may not be um, the make or break consideration for continuing lithium. The renal function, especially in older patients like um, my little lady, there are things that we need to keep in mind. As patients get older, they reduce their GFR. Um, when patients, uh, their glomerular filtration rate, patients who are just on lithium, after one year, there was a statistically significant decrease in their GFR compared to patients that weren't on lithium. It was a big enough sample size that they statistically found a difference um, because it was only, the range was zero to five milliliters per minute. Um, the average was right around three. So maybe not a clinically significant change where it's gonna move somebody to a different um, category or have them develop chronic kidney disease, but definitely something to keep in mind, especially over time as patients lose some of their renal function. Other things that the, this meta-analysis found um, was that patients on lithium were um, not able to concentrate their urine as much. It was 15% less concentrated than their peers. But when they looked at ultimately if patients went into renal failure and required renal replacement, so some type of dialysis, there was no difference between patients that were on lithium and patients that weren't. So we need to closely watch renal function. We may have to dose adjust the lithium long term, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't necessarily use it. Um, if they get toxic, that's a different story because that could damage the kidneys and they may not necessarily bounce back. That was the biggest reason why they didn't want to put that lady back on lithium. Um, the psychiatrist was willing to give it a trial, and it was, um, it was pretty impressive because as soon as she started back on it, she essentially was, um, her symptoms had improved. She was still a little hypomanic the first time I saw her, but um, she stopped the other two medications on her own, and she was much better. Um, and she, she was willing to undergo the blood tests and everything else so that she could stay on it because she knew it worked for her. So seeing some of those repercussions, um, and we didn't even talk about, so the calcium and parathyroid hormone, um, those tend to be higher in patients on lithium by 10%. So it doesn't mean we can't use them, but it does mean it is a little bit trickier. So that's where that shared decision-making is so vitally important, making sure that patients, their caregivers, their families, those that are gonna help them are all, all on board with what the potential risks are and what needs to be in place so that we can safely utilize this medication. And that brings us to the monitoring. So before starting lithium, it's important that we have some baseline values. So electrolytes, the renal function, thyroid function, vital signs, it can cause EKG changes, so it's, it's helpful to have a baseline EKG um, so that we have something to compare to after they're on lithium. And pregnancy status. So there have been reports of teratogenicity, um, especially the Epstein anomaly in patients who have been on lithium, but some of the meta-analyses have not been able to show how frequently that um, occurs. So it is something we definitely need to keep in mind, and we have to monitor those patients a little bit closer. Once they start treatment, we still are gonna continue to monitor those as well as lithium levels that we're gonna look at in just a second. And when patients are started or there is a dose change, just as the reminder, it does take about four to five days before um, we want to check the lithium level so that they can get to steady state. And ideally, if we can get that level about 12 hours after their previous dose, so we're getting a trough level, that would be helpful. That tends to be most helpful. Because we are going to be closely monitoring, um, there's a relationship between serum concentration and effect, um, as well as with toxicity. That is the black box warning that lithium carries. Um, because it is such a narrow therapeutic window that we do need to be very cautious. 
So usually the therapeutic range is between 0.6 and 1.2 milliequivalents per, per milliliter. So the 0.9 to 1.2 um, is report, reported most frequently in patient because patients can start developing adverse effects um, within that range. So 0.6 to 0.9 being a little bit more commonly used on the outpatient side. Moving into the mild toxicity, um, as soon as they start to climb, even within that normal range, we can start to see mild toxicity. And this can be impacted by their hydration status. Um, so at times like this where individuals might be um, starting to be out more, it is important that they keep their hydration up because they can start having some mild toxicity symptoms. Um, in the pharmacy, we would often see the tremor initially with those patients. And it was like, oh gee, does that happen right after you take your medication? So encouraging them to get their level checked as well as get their hydration up sometimes can catch it early. It can progress pretty quickly and patients over two can um, start to develop really significant um, problems. Seizures, loss of consciousness, renal failure, um, they can have uh, neurologic damage that's irreversible um, and it can be potentially fatal. So keeping close tabs on that would be helpful. So it is an effective medication, and I have a trust me on that one because we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. Um, but that efficacy does come with a cost, and it is important to keep that in mind. Many of the adverse effects patients may develop some tolerability to, but we can manage some of the other ones. It just is important that we do that monitoring. We have a little bit closer contact. And with 